right. So um, I'm going to start out with established endocrine association EBS, so very few. Uh, and then we're going to talk about POTS. And first starting out with a, a few reminders about uh, symptoms that could suggest an endocrine disorder in patients with POTS. And then we're going to talk about the pituitary adrenal function in POTS, uh, a little bit of endocrinology 101 to make sure everybody understands everything after that. And then we have Bob Mansur Shamali with us here today, who has done a series of uh, tests of pituitary adrenal axis in patients with POTS. So that should be very interesting. All right, I'm not sliding very well. Okay, so um, in terms of established endocrine association with EBS, uh, there really is only only one strong association, and that's uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH, uh, associated with a TNX, uh, which is a tenacity X, uh, and fusion gene. So before we get to that, I'm going to review uh, CAH, since some of you know a lot about it in here, and some of you don't. All right. So you've heard of steroid hormones. Steroid hormone is one that starts with a cholesterol uh, <coughs> starting point. So here we have uh, the cholesterol um, can be uh, metabolized into cortisol, which is a, a main uh, hormone that supports blood pressure and uh, heart function and is really, really required for survival. Um, aldosterone, which uh, helps hold on to uh, sodium and excrete potassium, uh, testosterone, which we all know about. Um, and so there are a series of enzymes um, that uh, allow this cascade to, to function. Okay. Okay. So CAH, there are actually three types, three main types that are seen clinically. They're all autosomal recessive. So uh, here we have 21-hydroxylase uh, deficiency here, which is the most common. We'll talk about that again. A minute, three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase deficiency and 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. And in 11 beta, uh, the oxycorticosterone increases, which causes hypertension. And in all, all of these um, blocks, you end up with low levels of aldosterone, low levels of cortisol. Um, 95% of CAH is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And um, whenever uh, endocrinologists are, are first kind of learning these pathways, we always pull up this, this diagram so we can tell which hormone to test the diagnosis. So for 21 hydroxylase deficiency, it's 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Uh, again, low cortisol, low aldosterone. And going down the wrong way, the weirdest mouse. Um, in so in boys, uh, we don't see much uh, of an effect with speech, but with girls, there can be virilization and uh, hirsutism, uh, uh, ambiguous genitalia, because testosterone and testosterone do go up with this uh, blockade. Okay, so CAH, the um, old sort of outmoded thing was classical and non-classical CAH. Classical severe uh, because of deficiency of cortisol and aldosterone, um, because of primary adrenal deficiency, we have salt wasting, hypotension, and neonatal death if it's not diagnosed in uh, boys. Typically in girls, there's uh, ambiguous genitalia, and so you have some heads up that there may be, it may be a problem. Uh, versus non-classical, which is a more mild form where cortisol and aldosterone are normal, and in females, it gives the phenotype exactly like polycystic ovary disease. You cannot tell them apart. Hirsutism, oligomenorrhea, uh, and if non-classical, males are going to have no, no phenotype. The current thinking is it's really a continuum, depending on how severe the enzyme deficiency is. And so you can see patients diagnosed with classical renal insufficiency in late childhood, even adulthood. We had a patient at the Baltimore VA this past year who was diagnosed at 30. And so what happens with the enzyme blockade, the uh, ACH, that is not the death, but goes up, the renal hypertrophy, and this guy actually presented as a mass. We were asked uh, by the general surgeons to comment on whether this renal mass was making any hormones. 
And in fact, it was compensatory adrenal hypertrophy once mass was removed from that uh, adrenal crisis. Uh, and so the first case of someone who had CAH and EDS was reported in 1997. And there's a, this is a patient with uh, hyperextensible skin and joints, this bruising of a knee, and some abnormal findings on this is EM of the skin. And the collagen fibrils uh, are at the low end of normal in size, and there are these electron dense bodies that are apparently uh, abnormal. Um, this is a blood vessel, and there's increased uh, thickness of the perivascular matrix, and in the cutaneous nerves, abnormal packing of the violet. So, giving you the idea that there's a connective tissue disorder. Okay, and in this patient's case, um, the group uh, determined that there was no tenacin X. Um, <coughs> um, the proband had no tenacin X. The mother and father in control did. And from that, um, a few years later, the same group figured out that uh, they had a they had basically um, a deletion of both the tenacin X gene, which I'll tell you more about in a minute and the CYP21B um, uh, hydroxylase. So both of these genes are within the HLA uh, complex and chromosome 6, and it's an area, uh, the gene has a high density uh, term the RCCX module, and its presence of lots of tandem repeats and pseudogenes, which increases the frequency of gene uh, conversion events and deletions. So in fact, um, just to point out the areas, there's this uh, 21B is the 21 hydroxylase gene, 21A is a pseudo gene, um, tenacin X, TNX is a gene for tenacin X, is a, is a large extracellular matrix protein that's involved in deposition of collagen uh, by skin. It's also expressed in the connective tissue of the heart, blood vessels, skeletal muscles. So all the connective tissues you'd expect in um, EDS. And it overlaps with uh, 21B. All right. So the novel deletion that they uh, describe. Um, so here's the, the whole gene. The standard. Um, I might need somebody else to drive for me. So I'm not too good at. It. So the standard CYP21 deletion CAH patients looks like this. But in the TNXXA deletion, uh, they're missing both the TNX and the CYP2021B uh, gene. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. No, that's a, that's a good question. This is a compliment to her paper as well. They, they don't. Yeah, they don't. No. All right, so in, um, in this study where they found the, this abnormal uh, gene. Uh, there's the proband, father, and sister uh, were all um, heterozygous for this, for this mutation. The proband is the only one who actually had CAH, clinically had CAH, with uh, the requirement for hydrocortisone and glucocortisone, and they were unable to find the second mutation, but they're, they're suspected that there is one. All right, so the initial reports of this TNX uh, mutation with combined EDS and uh, CAH is in 1997, as I mentioned, there are about 15 cases reported. So this is not a common thing, although I think we probably need to look for it more often. And uh, the phenotype is similar to the classical EDS, those who are recessive, but without the perfect scars or fibroid in the skin. So, so that should be a distinguishing feature to help us recognize them. And they have a complete absence of TNX, uh, the tenacin X protein that I showed you in the very first case. Um, <coughs> joint and skin hypersensibilities, bruising, large, large joint dislocations. They can also get um, COPD, get fibrosis, rectal uterine prolapse. So you think about some of our EDS patients who have these things. I mean, they're, they're not common, but we, I'm sure everybody, does everybody see those patients? We see a few. The prolapse, or, um, so we can think of this condition in those patients. Um, so there have been then this later report in 2003 
um, of haploid insufficiency, really a more of a, a dominant uh, transmission, where the amount of the TNX protein, as you might expect, is reduced, but it's not, it's not completely absent. And the phenotype is less severe. Okay, so this is the same, same group that uh, reported the initial patient. Uh, they're in uh, generally one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and they went back to look at 20 uh, heterozygotes, uh, family members of their first index case. And they said, well, let's, you know, let's just look more closely. We think they're asymptomatic. And um, so the, the patients who are uh, dark, all black, uh, have CAH and uh, no, clinically have CAH. And so here they're showing the tenacin X in um, normals and the uh, EDS patients were not within these, these families and, and those to this, this category had reduced amounts of tenacin X. Now, in all fairness to endocrine folks, um, I didn't see any evidence that they tested cortisol in uh, the heterozygotes. Uh, so, you know, whether they truly, but we, we expect that they would be at the level of cortisol because we know that the CAH uh, heterozygous carriers do not, uh, do not have adrenal insufficiency. All right, um, here's a couple later reports. There's not a lot in the literature about this, but a few. So this is a, another family um, that was from China. And they had one um, family member that Kobe had who had, sorry about that, I hope nobody's getting seizures from the moving ramp, <laughs> who had CAH and uh, EDS. Um, and they had um, an interesting finding of bifid uvula, so no longer the slowest beats on that. <laughs> and are there other conditions bifid uvula? Thick one, okay. Uh, so add that to the, to, the, to the list. And they also had a, a fibrocuspid aortic valve, which is kind of cool. So here's the vitamin uvula. Oh my gosh. Okay, there's the vitamin uvula. I think it's down to go forward. Oh, I, I was using this. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to go back to the clock. Yeah, here. So this is uh, showing arachnidactyl. I guess we would typically like to see that in the hand more easily, but uh, they chose to feet. And here's the quadricuspid area valve. This is not the only report of that. There's one other at least one other case of quantum positive error. Has anybody ever seen that? I've never seen it either. So I guess if you see it, this would be a condition to think of. And let's try to go to the next slide. I have the same problem. Okay. Well, I'm glad it's not just me then. Um, and it, well, that could be. Yes. I mean, the non-endocrinologist is right. Okay. That's probably it. Yes. We're so used to feedback loops from our back and forth. Uh, then there was this report uh, just a couple years ago um, of just a figure deletion in the same, uh, same gene, in the same area. So this patient was missing uh, 621B <coughs> and uh, melanocyte stimulate 115, which is all with ovarian development. So this patient had primary ovarian failure. Okay. Um, this it's just another case. Again, it's very, very little in the literature, but uh, depending on what, what there is. And down here, there's a left ventricular diverticulum. Have you ever heard of that? You see that? I mean, not close down my eye? No. So this is a child. Um, that's okay. Okay. Oh, this does work. Okay, great. Wasn't working before. Yeah. All right. So you get an idea of the phenotype, and, and look, the hyperextensibility is really pretty, pretty profound. Look at this. And some of the pictures um, in, in this figure uh, deletion show the really extensible skin of the neck. I think many of us have seen patients like that where they they don't have hyperextensibility at the normal place, but other areas are really hyperextensible. So I don't know 
that this uh, particular deletion, uh, or the, the fact that it's a NASA X that, that they're missing, um, <coughs> is involved in the, the area of skin that's more hypersensible. So, so how uh, how common is this? So, <coughs> there are a couple studies that have looked at that. So, uh, NIH group looked at uh, all of their CIH patients due to 21 hydroxylase deficiency, um, and they found that 7% had the tenacin uh, X deletion. So it was 192 families, and 13 of them, I believe, had, uh, had this. And of EBS, hypermobility patients, uh, of which the prevalence um, at least reported is one in five thousand. I don't know if you that probably more like one in three thousand. You think? Nobody knows, but it seems I just, I your criteria. Yeah, yeah. But it's <clears throat> I think that it's probably more common than that, but the overall prevalence is one in five thousand or so. Uh, and and only three percent of them have this SFB deletion. That was five of 151. Uh, yes, patients, and this this study uh, used really nice controls: rheumatoid arthritis patients, psoriasis, and uh, with skin problems, and healthy healthy controls, and none of them had the. <coughs> okay, so so we've got the background of CAH, and I'm trying to make this a practical um, talk so that you come away with what do we do with this information, you know, flat practical clinical level. Um, so, if, if you're thinking of uh, adrenal insufficiency or, or this uh, uh, vacancy deletion syndrome, uh, we want to measure AM fasting cortisol, so cortisol peaks in the morning from 4 to 6 and then it goes down, uh, it comes to almost zero at midnight. So, uh, normal cortisol is, is considered to be 18 now, pretty much everybody agrees with that. And a normal 17 hydroxy progesterone, which again goes up with the 21 hydroxy deficiency, is under 200, you don't need any further information. Over 200, then you need to do an ACTH stimulation test. If it's over 1,000, then the patient is likely affected. Uh, <clears throat> so if you measure a cortisol and it's significantly low, you can either do an ACTH stimulation test yourself or send the patient to uh, endocrinology. And then if the uh, primary adrenal deficiency is uh, confirmed, uh, do the genetic testing. Um, so now we're going to uh, move to from primary adrenal insufficiency up to the POTS, and I'm going to just just mention a few endocrine associations that might make you suspicious a patient has an endocrine disorder. And uh, you know, without going through the whole um, pathophysiology of, of POTS, um, we all know I think uh, that many of their symptoms could, could be consistent with pheochromocytoma palpitations blood pressure irregularity, and so in this review they recommend um, testing uh, adrenal function. I disagree <laughs> with what the specific test they recommended, so when we're looking for adrenal insufficiency, we don't do EM cortisol, we just do AF, early morning fasting cortisol, and it should be serum, and we don't really do a thyroid cascade, we do 3, 2, 4, and TSH. And the single best screen test for FIO is plasma free metanephrosis. So if you feel comfortable, you can order those for the straight Um So normal testing cortisol, as I mentioned, is 18. That rules out adrenal insufficiency. However, you have to be a little bit careful about albumin. If the patient has renal disease and they have low albumin, it's an inpatient uh, of the albumin because if we're measuring actually total, total cortisol, it's bound to albumin circulating. Uh, there's no free serum cortisol measurement. If the albumin is less than 2.5, the normal cortisol is about half or higher. Um, salivary cortisol is useful to diagnose uh, flushes, hypercortisolism, but is not useful for diagnosing adrenal insufficiency. And I wouldn't recommend uh, doing that. <coughs> okay, so let's just, just review again to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, the HPA axis, so the hypothalamus. Uh, makes corticotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the pituitary, makes ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, that stimulates the adrenal, which makes cortisol. That's pretty simple. 
And the cortisol uh, feeds back on both the pituitary and the hypothalamus, creating a beautiful feedback loop. Endocrinology will love feedback loops. It's very logical. Um, what stimulates the HPA axis is to turn it on, express hypoglycemia, will stimulate it. And what suppresses it most commonly is exogenous glucocorticoids. There are other things, but that's the most common. Okay, so now <coughs> the adrenal also makes um, aldosterone, as I mentioned, which is extremely important. Now hold on to salt, sodium, get rid of potassium. Uh, and although if you give ACTH, uh, the adrenal will put out more aldosterone, it's really not controlled by ACTH. It's controlled more locally by the kidney. So if you have a stimulus such as a low volume, dehydration, um, low blood pressure, renin, uh, and those in the nose say renin, not renin. Renin has two ends, and it's an enzyme in the stomach of cows. Um, <coughs> at any rate, uh, so, so renin made from the JG cells of the kidney stimulates angiotensinogen made by the liver to convert to angiotensin 1. And then by angiotensin 30 enzyme, we all know about ACE inhibitors, uh, which is present in the lung of the kidney, we make angiotensin 2, which is a vasoconstrictor, and then that stimulates aldosterone. Uh, so it's just, it's helpful to just be a little bit aware of, of that when you're you see a patient with adrenal insufficiency, so you can try to figure out if it's primary or central. Okay, and as in all good endocrine situations, aldosterone negatively feeds back on renin production, so that if you have a, a primary hyperaldosterone enzyme, and aldosterone is creating too much of renin as well. Oh, well, let's go back to the dial. Okay. All right, so um, the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. Uh, you have your, your cortisol that's uh, below 12, let's say, and you're very suspicious. Um, you can do uh, an ACTH stimulation test um, to, to confirm that, and if the cortisol is above 18, then you, you know you're normal. So when we're trying to figure out primary or central, we just have to remember basic endocrine facts. Um, so with primary adrenal insufficiency, um, the ACTH stimulation test is extremely accurate because it, we're just measuring what the adrenals would pop out. No problem with that. Um, although I should just make a caveat here that for a while the, there was a low dose ACTH stimulation test that was, that was popular. That has been pretty much debunked. Uh, it is not, uh, the, the problem with it is that the, the normal Fortress in the standard dose, 250 micrograms, comes in a vial, and with one microgram dose, you have to dilute. And like many hormones, it will stick to the tubing, and really, studies show that oftentimes it's no uh, ACTA injection in the, in the, in the vial that's being uh, ejected. So we, we use a 250 microgram dose now for everybody. So for primary adrenal insufficiency, you have your low cortisol, and then you can easily just measure renin, which should be elevated and aldosterone should be low, uh, and the ACTH level should be high. And it's amazing how often this isn't done. We do agree in inpatients, patients with diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency, and nobody does this to you know, make sure that it's central as opposed to as opposed to primary. And it's very important for treatment because uh, a patient with primary adrenal insufficiency is going to be treated with uh, hydrocortisone and uh, hydrocortisone or an app, but a patient with central only needs hydrocortisone because the aldosterone is controlled by the, by the radiation. Oops. All right. Okay. Now, in <coughs> central adrenal insufficiency, it's more, uh, more hazardous. Um, so if we use the ACTH stimulation test to, to uh, evaluate central adrenal insufficiency, but if it's relatively recent and onset, the adrenal sets are still used to seeing that chronic stimulus of the ACTH. It's revving them up, priming them to respond to ACTH. So you can have a falsely normal ACTH to test. Um, so a fasting AM cortisol is still accurate. Early morning unstimulated cortisol is still accurate for central. Uh, but the gold standard is the insulin tolerance test. Um, CRH, for a long time we, we used it and thought we knew what normal ranges were, but they were never actually uh, Never actually good criteria to develop what blood and normal response is. So 
for that one out of another fashion. So the insulin tolerance test is <coughs> um, the gold standard to look for uh, at central adrenal insufficiency. So in this, uh, with the IGT, we give patients insulin, the purpose to make them hypoglycemic, it must be symptomatic. It's, it's a little bit of an anxiety for the test because if hypoglycemia is not very comfortable, you're sweating. Anxiety you're, for the patient or for the provider? Both. Both, yes. Um, but they have to be symptomatic and then you draw uh, the cortisol and, and sometimes you also do growth hormone. Uh, and then that, that is a, really it's a it's an unphysiologic test, but it's a physiological stimulus to uh, to the HPA axis. All right, so what do we know about adrenal function in PDS in general, and what do we know about in POTS? And again, I'm not going to go through the, the POTS physiology. You all know it's very complicated, but just to point out that some of the key factors are venous pooling in the legs that leads to reduced venous return. And that then stimulates sympathetic output, and then the palpitations uh, come, and some of the uh, other symptoms, uh, nervousness. I've heard patients say that they feel like they over-respond to everything. I don't know if you've heard that. They just feel like they're on edge and, um, and, and over over responding. So um, in uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm about to well. I'm going to show you a, a study in just a second, but interestingly, there's really not been any systematic study of adrenal function in this, uh, in spite of the, until you hear about Dr. Shamali's data. Um, there is this study, which is from the Brigham, um, where they studied women uh, with POTS, 10 patients and 11 controls, and uh, in various uh, stages of the menstrual cycle. And they found, so this is uh, plasma ring and activity, POTS controls, aldosterone, and vasopressin, uh, which is also known as a diuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary that helps hold on to water. It's also given, you know, on the, you guys in the back know about vasopressin, ADH, so it's, it's used for uh, pituitary insufficiency when patients have a tumor removed, they lose their posterior pituitary function. It's also used for uh, enuresis, bedwetting in kids. And it just hold, helps them not be to urinate. It's used on the battlefield to keep fluid in the vasculature uh, to compensate for blood loss. Um, so what they found in this, this study was that the renin uh, was really turned on in, in these women. So this is the uh, mid-luteal phase and the early follicular phase. Uh, there really wasn't that much of a difference in the, the phase of the menstrual cycle, but the, the renin was really, really turned on. But um, aldosterone was not. Uh, which is which is interesting, and it may just be because really what was needed was the bit of constrictive acid of the uh, angiotensin II, but really isn't known. So in this study, one would have thought that they would check cortisol, but no, no cortisol was, was done, uh, unfortunately, because uh, central adrenal insufficiency would be a good answer for this. Uh, all right. So, um, adrenal insufficiency and autonomic neuropathy. So, Liz, what's really interesting about the study is if you look at the, can we go back to the curve? Um, um, if you look at the, the plasma renal activity slide where they're saying there's a significant difference, right? Yes. Because they're comparing each time point with uh, the other phase of the menstrual period right. time point. Yes. Right? But if, you look at the panel B when you're looking at aldosterone, um, they're doing the same type of time point comparison, right? Yeah. And they're showing that none of them are significantly different. However, if you look at the curves as a whole, yeah, you have to look at the chances that that's just random is going to be a lot less, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. it looks like there's something there. Yeah. So, so there, there yeah. may be some tracking together. But yes. I, I guess I was, and I should, I should mention that this is two hours of standing. Uh, but I guess I didn't really see much difference in the controls versus the POTS patients. Oh. So these look pretty similar. These are controls. And those are different and phases of the menstrual cycle? Um, yeah, so the mid-luteal phase, so, yeah. early follicular phase. So the early follicular phase, there's a lot of estrogen uh, secreted. Luteal phase, uh, the adrenaline is high, estrogen is lower. 
Um, and then with, after a full hour of standing, you get a uh, vasopressin uh, increase release, which I guess you could also just attribute to the problem of venous return, uh, this you know, normal physiological uh, response. They're not. Right. Uh, yeah. Are those, those are some of them? Or these are pos they're all pos patients? These are pos patients, and there are 10 of them. We didn't say whether they, they did. Can't wait for what well. I know. It's, it is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. All right. So what about adrenal insufficiency and autonomic neuropathy? Um, so there's an association. So, so with uh, POTS, you know that there's some autonomic dysfunction, and is there any idea that the two would go together? But there is this condition uh, first reported by Albro in 1978, the adrenal insufficiency and achalasia, uh, and a lack of lacrima absent tear tear formation. It's a recessive condition due uh, to mutation of the AAS gene, um, and Certainly, adrenal insufficiency has been uh, reported in other types of autonomic neuropathy. I have to put a plug in for my dad's book. <laughs> so I grew up in my entire academic career thinking or knowing that central adrenal insufficiency could go with autonomic neuropathy. That's my dad always said if I was preparing a case to him, oh, you should do a, you know, an IPT because maybe with, with central adrenal insufficiency goes with autonomic neuropathy, but there's actually not a whole lot in the in the literature about that. And so that's kind of you have to present case <laughs> Well I often did. Why not? Did good advice. Um, so in my experience just with um, you know this background, um, I had had a handful of patients with EDS and POTS, you know, over the years who had central adrenal insufficiency, diagnosed by IPT, and many more who did not have it, who I thought had central adrenal insufficiency. And I don't have this, have them systematically put together, but some were, you know, Ellis City, some were Hopkins, some were Maryland. Uh, but Dr. Shamali, who is here with us today, has systematically performed uh, insulin trauma tests in 30 patients with POTS, referred by Dr. Ramesh Karana, our now dropping specialist in the memorial. And he is here today to present his data. Um, and Mansur is a clinical associate professor of medicine uh, part time at the University of Maryland and primarily based on the Union Memorial. So I'm going to turn it over to him now. So I'm, I'm, re I'm really today. nervous about using the mouse now. Uh, since <laughs> now, you want me to so. try to die? No, that's now. okay. I'm going to try to do it. So thanks. It's really nice to meet uh, some of you. Some of you have heard of what I've never met before. Um, and so I'll tell you how my experience started, and then, because um, it wasn't so systematic as Liz made it out to be. Um, so it was my first few months in Baltimore. I did my different training in Boston, and then stayed on faculty at Mass General for a couple of years, and then decided to move back to Baltimore. So um, I, what somebody heard that there's this you know, new endocrinologist in town from Boston and must know what he's doing, so came to see me. Um, so she's 27 years old. Um, she's a nurse. Uh, and um, actually, um, we didn't know that she had POTS right when she first came in. She just complained of severe disabling fatigue. She was able to go to work and do her job, but she was extremely uncomfortable and um, working below her, her capabilities. Um, she had had a history of um, um, these sort of palpitation episodes, and she, because she was a nurse, she'd do uh, a finger stick glucose, and she told me she's hypoglycemic, but she was young and really thin, and I think her glucose was at 71, were probably normal. Um, and, um, and then she had word, word finding, uh, language difficulties, some neurocognitive complaints. Um, she had a history of um, uh, oh, and her, one, her primary care physician had given her a beta blocker for her tachycardia without a diagnosis, as, as often is the case. She had a history of mitral valve prolapse, um, Raynaud's phenomenon, and she felt really that everything started after this febrile illness that she recalls two years before. Um, she just never seemed to recover from a really bad case of the flu, and 
Um, she sought help from multiple medical providers and specialists. So I took her history, I examined her, and there was really nothing on physical exam except that um, I often will repeat the vital signs that my medical assistant did because we seemingly never do it right. And I don't know how, how, how hard we have to work with them to do vital signs, but um, her heart rate went up when she stood up. And um, this was a while ago. This was, say, 13, 14 years ago. I actually didn't know much about the automatic nervous system because they don't teach it well in medical school, residency, or endocrine fellowship. And um, I, I thought it was strange. Um, her blood pressure didn't drop, but her heart rate went up. Um, and um, so she told me that she thought she had an endocrine problem and wanted me to figure out what it was and treat her. Um, and so here's the moment of truth. It worked. Okay, so um, I did the first test of adrenal insufficiency that we often do, which is the ACH stimulation test that Liz talked about. This, this test looks at um, primarily the function of the adrenal gland itself. Um, it can also give us, because any adrenal insufficiency can, of any sort can cause uh, a, 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 an abnormal result with the ACH stimulation test. That's because ACTH is a trophic factor to the adrenals, not just a stimulatory factor to cortisol. So let's say if a patient is having a neurosurgery and the neurosurgeons dissect or sever the uh, pituitary stalk and there's no ACTH coming, eventually the adrenal glands will atrophy and this test will become positive. In other words, giving an exogenous ACTH injection to an atrophy adrenal gland would result in an insufficient cortisol response. So very severe central adrenal insufficiency or ACTH deficiency can cause a positive result. Um, not just Addison's disease, which is autoimmune adrenal destruction, or TB to the adrenal glands, for example. But because this test is easy, it can be done without a physician. The, the patient gets a blood test, a baseline cortisol. It can be done any time during the day and gets a, an ACTH injection and then a repeat blood draw. Liz pointed out that typically in the textbooks, the repeat blood draw is 30 minutes and 60 minutes out after the injection, but the data show that there's no real um, diagnostic distinction between the 30 and the 60 minutes. So in everyday practice, we just get two values, a baseline and a stimulated value. Um, and as Liz said, the normal response should be greater than 18. Well, her, her peak in, uh, cortisol to the ACTH stimulation was 26.9, and um, basically uh, rules out primary adrenal failure. Theoretically, it doesn't rule out central uh, adrenal failure from ACTH deficiency because um, it could be that there's some partial ACTH deficiency that's keeping the adrenal glands um, in, uh, with, with, with preventing the adrenal glands from atrophying, but not allowing them to secrete cortisol efficiently. So, so the insulin tolerance test is what we can do to rule out central adrenal insufficiency more conclusively. I generally don't like to proceed to that test because it's very labor intensive, it's uncomfortable for patients, it's time consuming for the providers, um, but in this case, she had an abnormal result. I'll show you how we do it. Um, at baseline, um, we inject enough insulin to cause hypoglycemia. So one of my patients was overweight and had just stopped by at McDonald's before seeing me. I couldn't give him enough insulin. I mean, he, I, I mean, he never, his blood sugar never dropped. And uh, in fact, he was very insulin resistant and probably was on the verge of developing diabetes. So this was a young woman about five foot five and 110 pounds, and uh, so she was very insulin sensitive. So she only needed maybe five, six units of insulin. Um, we typically do it intravenously, and then the hypoglycemia occurs typically in about 20 minutes. That's how long it takes IV regular insulin to cause hypoglycemia. So at that point, the patient is supine, um, and um, we look for signs of an adrenergic response first. So we look for uh, the patient to complain of palpitations, tachycardia, diaphoresis, um, and um, even then that's not good enough. 
for me. I like to look for neuroglycopenic respo uh, responses, meaning I want to know that the patient's not thinking right, they're starting to slur their speech, because that tells me that the, the hypoglycemia has gone to a more, it takes more hypoglycemia to cause those symptoms than to cause just an adrenergic response. The other thing is, the adrenergic response is quite variable, especially in patients who may have autonomic dysfunction. So, so the, the neuroglycopenic response is very, very much. The problem is then you're you're on the verge of potentially harming the patient. So, so I've got the I give the insulin. I've got the two IVs. I've got the uh, P50 uh, ampule ready to go. And then when the patient's neuroglycopenic, boom. Um, so it rapidly I, I've never had a problem. I've never had a problem. It's it's. I to be Yeah. Yeah. That's that's true. We don't do that anymore. Though. No. We usually use the same Yeah. So. That's right. It's it's a poor man's ECT. You don't need equipment. You don't need my medical engineer. Yes. I'm usually pretty successful with about 0.1 units per kilogram, and um, so so it's weight based. Um, and then um, if I don't get a hypoglycemic response, I give more. Yes. So that helps. Like that patient who went to McDonald's, actually, I told him not to eat anything. He just forgot. So I, and then he didn't tell me. And then when I had trouble, I'm like, what's going on? Right. So, um, so um, now, um, typically, so what, I'm plotting her growth hormone for some. Oh, so the reason we measure growth hormone is growth hormone has. So, so the. There are no glucose responsive neurons in the hypothalamus. They're somewhere in the in the brain, um, and, the, and the adrenergic the glucose responsive neurons that that, monitor, that detect hypoglycemia innervate the hypothalamus. So it's really uh, and those neurons are sort of uh, outside of the blood brain barrier. So so they can respond to systemic hypoglycemia. Um, now, um, the other hormone that's a counter-regulatory hormone to insulin is growth hormone. So in looking for, to, to, at the integrity of the endocrine system, the neuroendocrine system, we can also measure growth hormone in the blood as a marker for normal neuroendocrine function. And in children with short stature, it's one way also to prove to the insurance company that this patient has growth hormone deficiency and can be treated <laughs> with growth hormone. Um, so I measured growth hormone uh, not because I thought she was an adult with growth hormone deficiency. She had normal height, and I didn't suspect it. But it was a, I mean, I have her on the table, and I'm already doing all this to her. Why not um, check another marker for intact neuroendocrine function? And um, the cortisol response was flat. Essentially, she had no response to the hypoglycemic stimulus. That was uh, her BG dropped. To like something like 35 milligrams per deciliter. She had symptoms. Um, it was a well done test, and she had no cortisol response and no growth hormone response. Either. So um, notice uh, the dextrose is given. So the hypoglycemic stimulus only has to be brief, right? So patients worry when I tell them I'm going to have you in for an hour, um, you know, they think they're going to be hypoglycemic for an hour. But the hypoglycemia stimulus is very brief, and they're symptomatic only for really less than a minute, a few seconds. Once the dextrose goes in, they feel fine. In fact, I usually have them bring lunch with them so they can be eating because I don't want them to have rebound hypoglycemia if more of the insulin is still active. And I won't let them go home until they've eaten something, uh, real food. Um, and so, so this patient had an abnormal cortisol and growth hormone response. While I was doing this, I had referred her to Ramesh Karana for autonomic testing because I thought this was weird how her heart rate went up so much uh, during the orthostatic vital signs that I did. And um, I hadn't actually met him yet, right? I just heard of him. And in fact, his office is one floor below my office in the hospital. So he calls me up and says she's very interesting. Um, and he did a 90-degree uh, chill table test. 
And if you if you notice, um, this is the time axis. So her blood pressure and heart rate were normal at baseline. And after a 90 degree tilt, um, her peak heart rate went to 120, which was um, approximately what? It was 40 points above baseline. And those will use about 30 points as diagnostic for POTS. And, and he records also symptoms during the orthostatic tilt. And, um, and of course, part of the diagnostic criteria is not to find hypotension, right? So if the patient becomes hypotensive and heart rate goes up, that's a different problem, right? That's not what. And um, in fact, her pressure went up, so maybe she has the hyperagonergic form, potentially. There's, we were talking earlier about how many different phenotypes you could classify patients at as. Um, and so um, because I found that she had adrenal insufficiency, uh, whether it's ACT, she had an MRI of the brain, there were no structural problems to account for it. So um, I treated her with cortisol supplements. And um, it's because I didn't know what else to do. Um, I had no explanation for her adrenal insufficiency. There, were, there was no structural lesion in the brain. And she went back and followed up with Dr. Karana, and he tested, and she was feeling a lot better, right? He tested her again, and um, I don't remember how long she'd been on hydrocortisone, maybe a few weeks. Um, and the repeat autonomic testing was unbelievably normal, actually. I wasn't expecting that to be the case. And again, this was an N of 1, um, but it was an intriguing N of 1. So then the floodgates opened and said, you know, I have a lot of patients with you know, dysautonomia and POTS and I don't know what, what, can you evaluate all of them? And I said, sure. I was a new doctor in the hospital and I wasn't that busy. And um, I, I said, sure, bring them over. So um, the question is, how many of these patients could I find? And this wasn't part of the study. This was just sort of came, patients came and they were referred for evaluation and I tested them. Um, so it was about 30. So when I when I made this poster that we presented at the um, American Autonomic Society meeting, this was in Mexico in 2005. Um, he said, "We'll put together your cases in a poster." And so I found about 30 patients. Um, all of them were diagnosed by POPs using the tilt table testing protocol that I that I explained, um, and um, they all had symptoms that were consistent with POPs as well because sometimes normal people have meet the POTS criteria on a 90 degree tilt test. And I didn't know that that was the case. There are, there are tests in medicine where um, if you have the objective measure that's positive, but you feel completely fine, you don't meet the diagnosis. So to make the diagnosis of POTS, you have to have clinical symptoms as well as an abnormal tilt test. Is that, is that right? So, um, so, he, so, so he made the diagnosis. And then I did the adrenal testing. I did the cosentropin test first. If that was abnormal, I didn't feel that it was necessary to subject my patients to a um, uh, insulin tolerance test because, I mean, in a research protocol, maybe you could do that. But in clinical practice, that would be not unnecessary. You have a diagnosis. Since, since the ACTH level can be measured um, and, and and in primary adrenal failure, the ACTH level will be elevated based on the disinhibition of the negative feedback that Liz spoke about. And so, still, uh, these patients didn't have primary adrenal failure; they had something central. Um, but I didn't need to do an insulin tolerance test clinically because they had an abnormal cosentropin test. So, there were 25 females and five male patients. They basically had an average age of 37, all were Caucasian. And on the, I looked, I tried to do some sort of statistics on the tilt table test. The mean heart rate of 90 degree tilt was 40 with a range of 25 to 65. Um, I'm not sure of the 25 though, because theoretically that would have not, that would have not counted as Fox patient. But when Ramesh says this patient has POPs, I believed him. that was my criteria. But when I look back, and, and I guess he'll say, okay, the heart rate went up 25, but the patient has symptoms, that's pop. So, and he's really rational, so who am I to judge? Um, so um, I did all the cosentropin tests, and, and as you can see, well, or maybe you can't see, 
Um, most of them are normal. So either the baseline cortisol is above 18, and um, at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, the normal range for cortisol is, it can be, I mean, patients can have low cortisol in the morning, um, but uh, 18 is typically the upper limit of the normal range. So if someone happens to be over 18 at 8 a.m., um, or even at any time of the day, right, because, you know, typically low cortisols uh, um, or high cortisols any time of the day um, can exclude adrenal insufficiency. So in endocrinology, we have this thing where if you're, if you're uh, suspecting an insufficiency of a hormone and the levels of the hormone are high, it could exclude, it, it could, it would exclude that. And the, the converse is true. If you suspect an excess of a hormone and then the hormone is consistently no, no, low, then, then that tends to exclude that diagnosis. So, so when the baseline cortisol, like this patient had a baseline cortisol of 30. I don't, can you guys see these numbers where you are? So if I had known that the baseline cortisol would have been 30, I wouldn't have administered the cosentropin uh, because there was no reason to. That's a pretty high cortisol and, and should exclude all forms of adrenal insufficiency. But because I did the test, at the, if I gave the cosentropin and got both results at the same time. Um, I didn't actually do it sequentially. Um, and there's a lot of variability in the cortisol values, but I found that there were three cases in which the cortisol uh, did not reach 18 uh, micrograms per deciliter. So you can see this is a 17, 15, and 15. And in, in, in two of the patients, the baseline cortisol was 0.9 here and 2 here, which was, if you get a baseline cortisol that low, it's fairly, it makes you think of adrenal, but at 8 a.m. in the morning, cortisol shouldn't be that low, right? And that, that's almost diagnostic in the right clinical context. Um, so, um, so these three patients, because I made the diagnosis with the cosentropin test, I did not subject them to an insulin tolerance test. Um, so then I went to uh, the next, now it's time for me to have trouble with my slide. Okay. Okay, there we go. Oops. Okay, so the insulin tolerance test results, um, I had some patients go to 60 minutes because cortisol peaks in response to hypoglycemia within 60 minutes. There's no need to drag it longer. But after I did a few patients and some of them were abnormal, I thought, well, let me look at growth hormone responses as well. And it, there are some patients whose growth hormone rises after, in the 60 to 120 minute time frame. So um, some of these uh, tests I, I, I extended to 120 minutes, meaning I would draw blood at baseline and at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, um, uh, I'm sorry, 90 minutes and 120 minutes. And what I found was that 13 of the 25 had abnormal cortisol responses. And uh, about 10 of the patients also had abnormalities in growth hormone. Um, and the growth hormone cutoff is five, and so um, I use that as the cutoff. So again, there wasn't a control group. This is just using the laboratory reference range as a cutoff. So it's more like clinical practice than a study. So it's really a case series, uh, a systematic case series, essentially. Um, and if you look at the ITT results, some of them show a flat line response, like um, the one, the proband patient. Now I'm trying to talk like a geneticist, right? Um, and some of them are um, showing an insufficient, but uh, um, a response that looked like there was some sort of response. So, so for example, 7 to 17 looks like a response, but it was an insufficient response. So technically insufficient, but some responsiveness, right? So, so again, you could almost categorize the responses, responses, those who didn't respond at all to hypoglycemia versus those who had a subnormal response or a submaximal response, and those who are normal. So the question that I had would be, did I observe this as a laboratory phenomenon, or would giving cortisol supplements to these patients make them feel any better? Um, and I really didn't know. And so there were a handful of patients who I said, hey, let's try you on low-dose physiologic cortisol replacement. And what I mean by that is that the normal adrenal gland during the typical day 
for those of us who don't have an immunohistocy, might make the equivalent of about 15 to 20 micrograms of cortisol equivalent in the human body. The reason I say cortisol equivalent is we don't give cortisol, we give uh, its chemical analog, hydrocortisone. When patients swallow that tablet, it's quickly um, hydroxylated, it becomes cortisol, essentially. So, so, and, and so if you measure the 24-hour output of the adrenal gland, it's roughly the equivalent of about 15 to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone. And that would be, if you do the steroid conversion, about maybe 5 milligrams of prednisone, um, maybe about 0.75 milligrams of dexamethasone, something like that. So these are doses of glucocorticoids that we call physiologic. And um, we call them physiologic because of, of what I said, that they're sort of comparable to the reference range of the 24-hour cortisol production for the normal individual who's not stressed, who's not ill. Um, however, um, many consider them super physiologic because in certain individuals, even that amount of exogenous glucocorticoid can suppress the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Some patients with hydrocortisone cream that they apply for a skin condition can, can get suppression of the HP axis. Um, and, and with intra-articular steroid injections that the orthopedic surgeon sometimes give, you can see some suppression. So um, we say physiologic, but it, it's still pharmacologic probably. And, and one of the reasons it's also pharmacologic is that um, the adrenal gland is adjusting the amount of corticoid it secretes you know, in real time, right, over the course of a 24-hour period in a circadian rhythm. And as Liz said, there's almost, there's very little cortisol made in the evening when someone is healthy, sleeping, going to REM sleep, um, tissues are healing, and, and you know, you're, you're in a very low cortisol state at that point. So when you give a synthetic steroid, um, then you're not really reproducing that, that physiological rhythm. So it's not just about the total milligrams, it's also about the um, circadian uh, exposure to all the tissues of the body, including the brain. Um, so in order to try to mimic that, typically I would give a, a BID dose of hydrocortisone since it's short acting. I try to avoid giving um, prednisone and dexamethasone because those are synthetic steroids that have a very long biological half-life and suppress the HP axis longer. So if you give hydrocortisone, which has a very short biologic half-life, you can um, split the dose up. And then I would say I'm giving someone 15 milligrams. I might give 10 milligrams in the morning and 5 milligrams in the mid-afternoon and none at night to try to simulate that circadian, endogenous circadian rhythm. So it's not perfect, but it's my attempt at replace that uh, replicating the rhythm. So um, in this graph, um, there are eight patients who, again, this is not a study, this is just giving a prescription for hydrocortisone supplements, and, and then um, we, we see the initial heart rate data um, at baseline um, on, on the tilt table test, and you see the change in heart rate, and this is the peak heart rate at 90 degree tilt, um, and that, that's the initial data, and then um, Ramesh would see the patient and sometimes he would, I mean this wasn't a study, so sometimes he would do the tilt table again and sometimes he wouldn't. So in these eight patients that we found um, of, the, of the 30, um, or I don't remember, I don't think I treated 30, but um, of, of the, we found that he had actually uh, uh, tested them on the tilt table a second time and you see the uh, baseline heart rate and then you see the change in heart rate upon, upon tilt. Um, and then on the last column, I did the difference between the cortisol-treated tilt table test and the baseline tilt table test, and I did some means and standard deviations and p-values, and you find that the resting heart rate change was about 8 uh, millimeters of uh, beat, beats per minute um, with a not significant p-value, but the orthostatic heart rate change was minus 13 um, with a significant p-value. This is, again, comparing baseline to um, the cortisol-treated total table. So it wasn't a control group p-value. It was you know, the patient compared to his or her baseline. Um, and so what conclusions can we come to? Well, um, 
Thanks, Liz, for making the slide because I, I didn't have uh, I didn't make the slide. Um, so do, do you want to do you want to comment on what you sure, think of this? Because sure. I don't know. no, but I mean, <laughs> from my perspective, um, I find that as a physician who takes care of patients with chronic disease, many conditions that cannot be cured, and at best we can mitigate the symptoms and prevent complications, right? These patients are very susceptible to placebo effect. They're very susceptible to uh, intervention. So, and this was not a controlled study. So it's, and it's kind of how we practice medicine though. First you see a patient, there's no data, there's no guidelines, there's no, um, you know, medical association that says do this in fact. So, so, you, so we have to use medical judgment and good medical judgment. We, we first do no harm and, and again, physiologic cortisol replacement has a very low risk. Uh, we're not going to cause the symptoms of glucocorticoid uh, uh, toxicity. We're not going to make them cushionoid at the doses that I've used. So, so the intervention had very low risk. And in fact, I wasn't really expecting them to do better objectively or subjectively. I just said, well, I don't really know what to do. We can try this. You're, there's a test that shows you have a certain form of adrenal insufficiency. It may not be complete. It may not be primary, but, and I'm not, and I don't have a, a pituitary tumor or radiation to the hypothalamus or a history like that that could explain it. But, so I gave them a trial, and then some of them made it back to their neurologist and were tested, and he got very excited. He said those changes, I, he told me he, he's done serial table tests on patients, and, and he thinks this is not just placebo effect. This is not just random chance. He thinks there's something to it. So, so in that case, when you have a case series, then the next step would be, is there anything here to do something more formal? And, and so I think that um, um, there, we have observed abnormalities in a, a good proportion of patients who have, uh, for whom a respectable neurologist is diagnosed with POTS and an endocrinologist has performed, um, you know, a good quality test for adrenal insufficiency. And um, intriguingly, some of them have symptomatic improvement um, and, and objective improvement with um, corticoid replacement. Um, and so, I, and that's as much as I can say, right? There, I, 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 there's something there. I think there's a signal that says maybe there's something to this. I don't have an explanation. I have some theories. I can draw. I love the box diagram that you showed, and I can show you where I think the HP axis fits into the, that diagram. But that remains to be elucidated, right? This isn't something that's in the textbooks or in the literature. 